Welcome to GRIT, the Real Estate Growth Mindset Podcast, hosted by Brian Charlesworth, founder of Sisu. Sisu provides growth automation software for real estate. You'll hear stories from real estate thought and technology leaders, team owners, and brokers on how they grew their business in a rapidly changing industry. You'll learn how to transform your brokerage and teams into a high-performing and analytics-driven business so you have a new, durable, competitive advantage against disruption in your market. So let's get right into it. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GRIT Podcast. I'm Brian Charlesworth. I'm the founder of Sisu and your host of the show. And I feel like it's been a while since I've actually recorded a podcast. So I'm excited about today. Trey, thanks for making this happen. I know we've published them, but you know I get stacked up where I record every day and then I don't record for a couple of weeks. So anyway, grateful to be here today with Trey Willard. I met Trey, geez, I would say right as I started Sisu. So about five or six years ago, I think it was five years ago, we were just getting ready to roll Sisu out. And I was at Jeff Cohn's event and you came up and introduced yourself. You were actually a Tom Ferry coach. You were going to help me drive that through the Tom Ferry organization. Anyway, I remember that very well up there by the pool. So yeah. anyway, we have today, you guys, Trey Willard with us. Trey is now a 27 person team over at KW out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And is crushing it. He did, I believe, 350 transactions last year and will do over 500 this year. And just that's that's the amazing growth that we love to see from our CSU teams. And Trey is also a CSU team. So anyway, Trey, what do you want to add to that? Yeah. So, Brian, again, thanks, man, so much for having me here. It's always grateful to, uh, to spend time with leaders in the industry, man, guys like you. And, you know, the goal is always to bring real value, meat and potatoes, not any fluff. So, you know, that's the goal today. The goal today is to provide some tactical stuff, some strategical things that people can implement in their business and hopefully have an immediate impact. So that's my goal today. So Trey Willard, 12 years now in the real estate business. And I've had an interesting path to say the least. So I, I started off as an assistant for an agent and I was an assistant for a couple of months while I got my license or finished wrapping up my license in 2010 of October. What does that mean? I started- Let's not skip over that. What is an assistant to an agent? I don't know that I've ever heard that one, Trey. (laughs) I've heard a showing assistant, but I've never heard an assistant to an agent. Yeah. So just just an executive administrative assistant to an agent, a buddy of mine who was growing his business and, you know, was looking for some leverage. We we actually waited tables together and I had been friends for years and and he knew or at least saw, I think, the talent in me at the time as a server. And, you know, I had a lot of friends who said, you should really think about, you know, getting your real estate license. I think it'd be something you'd be really good at. And, and, you know, I graduated from LSU in 2007. I went to school for business communications and technical sales, you know, and and I thought I wanted to sell a pharmaceutical or medical device because at the time it was kind of the sexy thing to do. It came with, you know, company cars and, you know, good money and some travel and things like that. You know, I actually got into doing some office equipment and telecommunication sales my first couple of years and just realized, you know, it wasn't for me, you know, B2B sales, knocking on doors and, and just trying to get in front of people just just wasn't my gig. So I went back to the service industry. Tim Houck is the guy's name. He's with Keller Williams. He's actually still with Keller Williams. You're talking about Tim? I hey, Tim Heil? Tim, no, Tim Houck. Uh, oh, but I do Tim know Houck. Tim Houck. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Tim in Austin. Yeah, so he brought me on and he's like, look, what would it take for you to leave the service industry and come work as my as my assistant? And I said, dude, and I was a professional DJ. I know this is kind of weird, but I, was, I had a lot of cash coming in and I was like, 400 bucks a week, man. I'll be your assistant, you know? And it'll give me some real estate experience. So I did that. And I was the worst assistant that you could ever imagine. I'm a very high D, high I personality. I have very little organizational skills. And we identified that. We knew that from the beginning. So that was we knew it was a temporary short-term thing. And it probably only lasted about two to two and a half months before I got my license. And first year with Keller Williams, I was rookie of the year. I sold 33 houses and was with the team for about two, two and a half years. Was that, not, was that the same friend who built a team and you were with his team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same so, thing. So, so I, instead I, of being his assistant, you were his top agent. Rolled into a buyer's agent immediately when I got my license. He hired another assistant you know, who took my place. And then we started to grow. So I think when I left, there was myself, a full-time administrative assistant. We had three, myself and two other buyer's agents. So that's what the team looked like. And then 
a friend of mine who owned a commercial brokerage approached me and wanted to start a residential firm on, you know, built with inside of his company and asked if I would be the one to kind of spearhead that. So myself and, and two other guys, Jonathan Starnes and Chase Muller took that on. And then that real Donnie Jai real estate one grew into a pretty decent size brokerage. I think we had 15 or 20 people and then Donnie sold and Berkshire Hathaway, we merged or franchised with them. And this happened in 2015. So I was a solo agent from 12 to 15. And then I, I built the W Group at the end of 2016. So 2016, I sold personally 113 units, bananas, you know, I put together a pretty awesome development. And anyways, greatest, probably greatest real estate year of my life at the time. Yeah. And I knew at that point, I, I couldn't continue to run at the speed that I was running by myself, right? So I got into coaching. I was actually coaching with NAAE. I don't know if you know, National Association of Expert Advisors. It was, gosh dang, it's going to drive me crazy. Big EXP guys, it'll come to me in a little while. Okay. I did Buffini and company coaching, you know, and then I got introduced to the Tom Ferry ecosystem in 16 and started coaching with Tom. And within the first, man, shit, within the first like, I guess six months, they were offering me a position to coach. Was Tom personally your coach or you were no. just being coached by no. his organization? Okay. No, coached by his organization. And it's funny how this this whole thing started, but started, built a team. And in 2017 was the worst year of real estate in my entire life. And I say that to be very vulnerable, to let people know that, you know, at the time it was all me. I decided I was going to hire agents. I wasn't really holding anybody accountable. I was giving all my deals away because I was, everybody was getting out of production at this point. And then I look back at my profit, my profitability at the end of the year. And I think that the business made like $10,000. So all of your so, profit would have been from your own production, basically. Yeah. And then all of my profit from 2016, I just watched my business account just dwindle away. And then I'll never forget. It was like around Christmas time in 2017 and we had committed, we were building, you know, a 3000 square foot new construction house, you know, and we're going from like a, you know, $260,000 house to like a $600,000 house. Right. So, I mean, we were inevitably doubling our, I said, I want to say our debt, our expenses, but you know, and, and you know, we looked at each other and we're kind of like, man, did we make the right decision? And and it was really kind of that that moment in time for me. It was just like, look, no more excuses, no more like we got we got to get to work. We're gonna get through this. And at the end of the day, it wasn't really that that bad of a situation, but it was a situation that just made you stop and think and say, you know, look, something's gotta change, right? Yeah. So, so that year that was so horrible, how many agents did you bring in? You it sounds like you just kind of went from being a high producing solo agent. To building a team at that point. And you actually, unlike most people, most people have a really hard time stepping out of production. Sounds like you stepped out of production immediately. Is that kind of what happened? Yeah, I didn't step out of production. The intentions were to step out of production. So like some of the referrals maybe that I would get that I would I would work, I, I just would maybe pass off to a team member to my wife or somebody. So it was my wife, myself, a guy named Brent Thompson and Clay Harris at the time. And we had an administrative assistant. So it went from me to three buyers agents in it, you know, and, and that was all based on like just the amount of lead generation or amount of lead that we had coming in from, you know, Zillow and Boomtown and, and different lead sources. So yeah, I had the opportunities. We just, we were not following up. We were not consistent. There was no level of accountability. Our process and our system sucked at the time. I mean, it was just not good. You know, if that's a lesson for somebody, the top producer who is out there and they think it's time to, because I'm really good at production, let me go start a team. That's not the mentality or the mindset to take. The mindset to take is, let me continue to do what I'm really good at, but then I have to hire somebody who's good at the things that I'm not. Yeah. That makes sense? Absolutely. So fast forward 2020, you know, we hired my, so I hired a listing coordinator and he became my operations director. And the moment he became my operations director, things really started to, really started to grow. We started hitting like hockey stick growth. He ended up moving on to something else. And and I'll say this, and I say this very humbly, but I truly believe that I have the best operator in the real estate sphere. Anybody, I, I would put my money against him. Daniel Woodson's the guy's name. He actually was a mentee under the CEO of Geico. Hmm. So he is a systems so from and processes. outside of the industry, a systems guru. Yes. Oh, systems guru. And so we hired him on. He's been with me for a little over a year now. And I mean, he's the guy and I'm the visionary, right? So if you read the book, Rocket Fuel, you learn about visionaries yeah. and integrator operators. Yeah. And I was always the visionary, but never had the integrator operator. So it was like the moment that I got him, 
man, it was just like <sighs> most. This is a note for you guys because most high producing realtors are definitely high D's and high I's, right? And so 100%. <laughs> you're not the integrator. So read no. that book and figure out who you are and surround yourself with that right person to be on your side like that. Yeah. So it's funny, Brian, you know, we'd go to the conferences, right? I go to Jeff Cohn's team building summit. I right. go to Tom Ferry's summit. I would go to all these and I'd come back and paralysis would set in because I would sit in front of my computer and I would try to build out some process or system and it just would suck all of the life and energy out of me. Right. Yeah. I wasn't the person for that. So once I realized, you know, we made the right hire on the operation side, it's been like, again, just a complete game changer. So fast forward again, right? So 334 units last year, we actually did 91 million in production. And so far year to date, I don't want to mess these numbers up. So I'm going to pop in my CSU dashboard. We've closed 367 units. We've got 61 pending and that equates to... 126 million in pending and closed volume this year. Awesome. So, congrats. Yeah. So, it's, uh, current, it's currently it's, sitting around the 425 neighborhood and on pace to yeah. hit 500. That's exactly that's exactly right. So, did just, you not get the word, Trey, that this year was not supposed to be as good as last year? Yeah, I'm hearing it every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we'll go there in a minute. I'd love to let you continue sharing your journey and then we'll. Dive. No, no. So that's the journey, right? I mean, I started off as an assistant and, and made my way into it with a lot of trips and falls and failures, right? And there's a, you have to look at every failure as an opportunity of an experience, right? What can I learn from here? So if you don't really ever look at like a failure as a true failure, you look at it as, as an experience or an opportunity. And, and just for me, like I've always been very like personal development, very like mindset is probably what I spend the most time on. Because I know what you think, you know, you can achieve, right? So like the old Henry Ford, if you believe you can achieve, or if you say, you know, you can, you can, if you say you can't, you can't, you know, it's just, I've truly believed. If you say um, when it will happen, if you say if it won't, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all those things. Yeah. So that, so that's it. So, I mean, that's who I am today. And we actually, uh, excitingly enough, we open up our first expansion on October 5th in Mandeville, Covington, which is on the North Shore. So we've already got three agents committed and a full-time administrative assistant, and we'll do something in New Orleans. So you have like the North Shore and the South Shore. So we'll do something in New Orleans in the first quarter of 2023. Congrats. So what made you. you decide to go there for expansion? Yeah. So they're 45 and 60 minutes east and south of me. New Orleans has a, about a almost double average price point. In Mandeville, Covington, is a lot of people leave New Orleans to move to the North Shore or they live in the North Shore and they commute over the bridge into New Orleans. So it's really just, it was kind of the next, that was the next thing for us. I mean, when you, Brian, when you look at the TAM, right, a total addressable market, there's 13,000 homes that are sold in East Baton Rouge Parish or the greater Baton Rouge real estate market that we service. Multiply that times two because there's two transactions, right, for every home. Now, are you, are you going to get yeah, are you going to get 26,000 or 24,000 opportunities? Well, no, of course not. So when you look at that, you're like, man, we're only barely scratching the surface of what's available. But what if we went to another market where there's an additional 13,000 and then maybe an additional eight or 9,000 home sales? Yeah. What does that look like? So this expansion team concept, I want to dive into that a little bit because you're just building your first right now. And yeah. we work here at CISU with companies like Livian that have over 50 locations and others, right? So so Adam uh, Hergenrother and I, we have been in a lot of dialogue recently. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. So what I want to ask, and this is really for those, you know, who are thinking about doing the same thing, because I think at some point you're going to have to do that to expand your market beyond the point you're at today. Spring did that last year, did an expansion team 20 miles south of here in Davis County. And, you know, it's made a ton of massive, massive impact on her business in a positive way. And so now she's doing one another 20 minutes down. But I guess my question for you is, who is running that expansion team for you? Yeah. So again, where I am today is I pull myself further away out of production It frees me up, right? It gives me some time and some energy to put into some different places, which number one is the expansions. My operations director is, believe it or not, he runs my team. He's in Atlanta, Georgia. I believe So again, 
he's I, doing this completely remotely. I think that is phenomenal advice you gave and you didn't really give it as advice, but I want to go back to it because I think it is advice. Yeah, for sure. Don't pull your operations person from the real estate industry. Pull them from another industry that knows operations. Yes. And you'll you'll be amazed at what that can do for your business. For sure, man. And he lived here, full transparency, and him and his partner had split, you know, his fiance and he wanted to move back to Atlanta where his family was. He has a daughter. And I said, yeah, let's give it a 30 days. And it, man, it's, he's more than exceeded my expectations, which now gives us an opportunity, you know, over time to, we could expand into Georgia and Atlanta right. and, you know, the outskirts of Marietta and Alpharetta and some of those other markets. I mean, we're, you know, I'm just vision, you know, future that that's where it's going. So myself and Daniel will run this and I have a team leader. So my t- the way this whole thing started was one of my my agents was moving to this market. And I said, how do you feel about being the team leader in our Mandeville Covington office? So just we're creating, you know, the goal is, is and this is what I talked to like Adam and those guys at, at Livian and some other folks about is how do you continue to create, let's call it a, a pathway or like a landing strip, you know, if you will, for your agents so they can continue to grow inside of your organization, right? I was uh, going to say, let's just call it growth. Growth, yeah. If you can give your agents growth opportunities, I'm seeing this as a major, major shift in this industry right now. Agents are staying with their teams now for four, five, six, 10 years. It used to be two years because teams weren't giving them that growth opportunity within the team. But you provide that growth opportunity within the team, they're going to stick with you. So that's that's what you're doing and that's how you're expanding. Exactly. You know, okay. and, and look, full transparency, we're, we're a Zillow Flex team. Zillow has given us opportunities to expand because our metrics are so stellar. They want to work with teams like us that are going to give them a very high return on their investment. Yep. So why are you guys so good? Like, what does Zillow see? What do you do different than other teams that are on Flex do so that they want you to expand with them? So, I mean, I'd say our metrics, right? I mean, they, they give us, you know, 65%, you know, set to met appointment. It's a 45% met with appointment. You know, they're looking at like an 11 to 12% offer rate and they want you to close somewhere between seven and 8%. I mean, we're exceeding those. And then you look at like their model as far as, you know, every market has a, a percent to market, if you will. And let's say the market is 150 or 125. You know, we're doing, we're 200% to market. We are very diligent on processes and systems and follow-up and accountability. And it's very much a production, right? If you're producing and your numbers are good, and we do, I do a 30-minute coaching call with every single one of my agents every month. And then my operation director does the same thing. And then we do quarterly reviews based on conversions. And that's everything from, you know, our Boomtown leads, Realtor.com leads, Zillow Flex, any PPC stuff we have coming in, you know, we have the, we use call action and we do the call text for more information. And then we do all like all the third party seller leads. We just, when you have the right person in the right seat, meaning my operations director, and you have the data and you analyze the data and you hold the agents accountable to the data because the numbers don't lie, right? You can't run from it. And that's what I love about CSU the most is it is so simple to track and measure the most important KPIs. And then you put it on this beautiful monitor and it just makes it look so good and so pretty and so easy to read. And not only to read, but to dissect and explain what does this mean? Yeah. Now, and I'm glad you're enjoying that because I built that to solve a problem that I saw when my wife asked me to help her grow her real estate business. And I want to talk about your wife here in a second as well. Yeah, for Uh, sure. But that's really how Sisu was born was I got from another industry, came in to help her grow her team and got to experience firsthand the pain of using five, 10 different systems to just get information from an agent to a transaction coordinator and then to be able to set goals and hold them accountable and have sales contests. So I want to talk about sales contests because you shared yeah. with me before this call that you're doing a lot of sales contests. True. What has that done for your business? So you said this in a podcast recently, and I love it. And this comes back to just something that even Adam and I were talking about recently. Appointments met and set 
are the biggest drivers or the biggest indicators that are going to lead to signed contracts or buyer signatures or listing contracts signed inevitably going to lead to showing houses and writing contracts and, and closing, right? Those are the two right. biggest, the number, I mean, meeting them is- Number, number one, one is met, yes. A hundred percent. Couldn't, I would not agree with you more. We used to focus on a lot of dials. We used to focus on conversations. And what happens is like, not that it becomes a little, not simplistic, but you've got to make it easy and simplistic for the agents, right? So what we did was we really just, we started saying, okay, guys, you're focusing on two things, two new appointments per week. And we know that if you set the appointments, the appointments are going to drive the conversations and the dials. Right. So when just stop focusing on the conversations and the dials, focus on two new appointments set per week which leads to roughly 12 appointments, right? Per month. Yeah. If you do the math on that, you work 48 weeks out of the year. You convert it a 70% of the time they say they're going to work with you. 70% of the time you get them under contract and then 10%, 90% they close. You got a 10% fallout. So you, you roughly have 42 to 45 homes sold per year. If you've been enjoying Grit, please help us continue to grow the channel by leaving a five-star review and sharing it with a friend. Now back to Grit. So you know exactly, you know exactly, yeah, and, I mean, and most don't, and so I want to, you know exactly so what it takes to sell 42 homes a year, right? What, what it takes from an appointment standpoint. So our numbers run, we run about 72% when we set an appointment, we meet with that person. 65% of the time that we meet with that person, we sign 64, 65%. Now the indicator- Are you, of like are you once, looking at monthly numbers right now? If you look at uh, annual numbers, it will show you the correct amount. There. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at this year, but for some reason, I don't know what happened because we've gone on something, of course, because I'm talking to you right now, we're on live, right? Or we're on a call. Either way, right? So the book, and when I say the book, the MRE, the Millionaire Real Estate book, right? So the Millionaire Real Estate Agent, it's funny, I actually have- how many times uh, have you read that book? I read it all the time, <laughs> I, okay. once a so, year. So like, it's always in your hand, getting notes, getting so like, Yeah, I'll show you what's next to my desk right here is the new MREA2 stuff. And I had it, I had it out, of course, like I'm going to sit here. I'm not going to waste a bunch of time looking for this stuff. But it was 70%, the, you know, the goal is 70% of the time that you set an appointment, you meet with the appointment. 70% of the time you meet with the appointment, you actually physically sign the appointment. Mm -hmm. Then once they're under contract, right, you've got a 10% fallout, which, or, yeah, 10% fallout, so 90%. Our numbers run like almost identical to the MREA. Like I said, 65%, I think we're like 70, 72%, then 65% on the set to met. I mean, I'm, excuse me, the Met to sign. And then once they go under contract, I think there's like an 85%, 82% chance that they're going to close. So I just, I've literally just, I am not the smartest person in the world. You know, I just, I need a process and a system and I just need people to just tell me what to do. I'm a machine. You just tell me what to do and I'm going to do it. Right. Okay. So what are your systems? Like, how have you dialed your business in to systems? Because I think everybody needs systems, but like. What are your systems when you say that? Yeah, so tech stack right now. So, you know, everything feeds into Boomtown. That's our, that's the CRM. So all of our leads is Zillow Flex leads. Nice. You still have to use the Premier Agent app to do all your updates and everything in Zillow, but the leads will funnel into there. Realtor.com, you know, we use Connections Plus. They all funnel into there. We use Call Action. So Call Action, we layer that with Boomtown for a lot of our text automation. So like lead comes in, Brian, I'll give you the process. Lead comes in. It's a Boomtown PPC lead. You automatically get a voicemail drop. Hey, Brian, Trey Willard, Keller Williams, the W Group. Hey, you just registered on our website to search for property. Look, hey, I was just calling us to follow up to see how I can assist you with your home search. Something along those lines, right? right. That email is dropped. It's pre-recorded. I think we have three or four of those. You immediately get a text message All and you, you get a follow-up. You get an email as well. And then the e-alerts inevitably, we have VAs who go in and set up e-alerts for everybody in Boomtown. So that that's how that process works. As far as like the call action, text the lead, immediately they're going to get information about the lead. It's going to go to them. All of their contact information gets funneled into Boomtown. So Boomtown kind of works as like the primary like hub CRM. These are your lead follow-up systems. <laughs> that's right. So that's, that's lead follow-up systems. 
we use KW, we use command, which is their CRM. And then what's awesome is like, we've built out a 36 touch campaign for all of our past clients and sphere of influence, right? So you and do that depend- in command instead of in Boomtown. Correct. And the reason we do that is because we want to keep our, like, we call them our Mets, right? People know you like you trust you and then you haven't met. So you, we're keeping those databases separate. So okay. it's, it's so just once it's easier to somebody, filter. Somebody, they move from Boomtown to Command. Is that what I'm hearing? Co- correct. And what okay. we have to do for compliance with Keller Williams is we have to have everything run through because all of like DocuSign, they're basically like file rooms for KW. You go into... And basically that's like your, basically like your sky slope or your, you know, right. transaction management yeah. software, you're, you're back, dot loop, whatever you use. Which yeah, by the so, way, so, CISU is integrating with command right now. And then the back end is our next integration. I can't stink and wait for that to happen. So that's how that happens. Now, if they go on an appointment, you know, we have appointment, we have like an appointment form set up on their CISU app or on the computer where they hit transaction and they got buyer appointment set, met, and then it's once it's plugged in, it's it's all there. So you have CSU is what we use to track and measure basically all of our data, right? All of our KPIs. Boomtown is where all of our lead generation inevitably happens, and then Command is our call it our transaction management slash sphere of influence past clients. And we have we have Slack, you know, that we use to communicate as a yeah. team. We have, I mean, the tech stack so that we have is. Are you doing the steps to close? If someone goes under contract, what are your steps at that point? How does the agent get things in the hands of the TC? And what does the TC work out of? Right. So the TCs work out of CSU and command. Okay. So what happens is the moment that they put someone under contract, right? It triggers automatically the checklist and the TC gets pinged and says, Trey just put one under contract. And we have a guy, his name's Dawson, who does like all of our intake paperwork. So he makes sure like from a compliance stance, we have everything we need from agency disclosures to, you know, sign purchase agreements, counter offers, you know, property disclosures, anything we need. He's got all of that in there. And then he uploads everything into command, right, which is for compliance. And then the other TCs, they have their checklist of things to do. So do we have to do a schedule and inspection? Do we need a wood destroying insect report? It's so easy. They just go to it every day and they just check things off the box, right? Are my listing coordinator who's- Do checklist or are you doing that in command? No, we're doing that in CSU. My, my listing coordinator who's sitting right in front of me, I mean, he gets the same thing on the listing side, right? When I go on a listing, I come in and I put the client's name, the address, the commission's the sales price, I put it all in there. I hit send. It sends him an alert. Now he knows that he's got a call. Now he's got to schedule the photos, the videographer. He's got to go ahead and work on listing packet one and listing packet two. And it all happens so systematically. Everyone on my team has a very specific role. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have multiple people doing multiple things. I have one person doing one thing. And everyone should run their business that way. So, right. Um, Shifting gears a little bit for the sake of time, you and your wife have been in this business together, I think, for for how long? <laughs> like She got her license in 2015. I've been licensed since 2010. Yes, we have been working together for, I asked her to, so she, uh, look, she made 40 grand doing marketing for a, a company locally. And I said, Whitney, come work for me. You're going to triple the amount of money you make. You're going to be a rock star in this industry. Yeah. And she did. She came on board. So- I see that more in this industry probably than any where this is a, in many cases, it's a family business. Maybe just talk about some of the challenges with that and some of the great things about that, because I think there can certainly be challenges with that if you don't set up your boundaries, right? Sure. So we have massive challenges and and I think the challenge, the biggest challenge is the fact that we just bring work home. We can never get away from work, whether it's employees or it's buyers and sellers or or whatever it is. It's just if there's one negative thing, it's just that you can't run away from it. It's just always there. It's always present. Right. Well, Um, Spring Spring and I are running two different businesses, but both in the real estate industry. And we have that exact same issue. So, So if I had to say literally the only time that we ever really probably even have tips about anything is typically overwork stuff. You know, Whitney and I have like, we have such an amazing relationship and we've like, I think it took us about a year or two ago to where like we really understood our places in like our lives and like how you can support me and how I can support you. And we have the mutual respect for one another. Does that make sense? 
Yes. And I think the hardest thing for us for the longest time was really understanding like what she needs from me, what I, and I need her to understand what she needs, you know, what I need from her and how do we align that? And we respect each other and know that this is your lane. This is my lane. And my lane is again, mostly on like the running the business side of things. She's an agent and she does incredibly well. But she's also taking in some leadership roles as far as like marketing and some different things like that. The flexibility is is probably the thing I would say is probably the biggest like pro for us because we love to travel. I love to spend time with my children. I love to spend time with my wife. We love to travel. We talked about 30A and, and spending time on the Gulf Coast. I mean, we do we do that often. Now, like spontaneously, we went for Labor Day, you know, and we're going to Napa next month for our anniversary for a week. And, you know, we're going to Boston over Thanksgiving holidays to go see some friends. If she had a job somewhere else, she couldn't take that time off mm-hmm. and be spontaneous. So I'd say that's probably one of the biggest pros is the flexibility that it allows us. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. That's great. So she is actually an agent selling. That's her role. She is. Yeah. And she, like I said, she takes some leadership. I mean, she meets with myself, my operations director, the marketing. I mean, she has a role as a leader in the team. She's also a mentor agent, but as far as like, she's not, she does not an an operator, right? Like Daniel's the operator, you know, like, I don't know if you know, I'm sure, you know, DJ and Lindsay, DJ and Lindsay are like two very, very good friends of mine. DJ is like a high D like selling machine slash like sales manager type. Dude, right. Lindsay's an operator. You right. know what I mean? Like For sometimes sure. I wish that we 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 could roll like that, but she enjoys selling and she's so good at it. So I want her to, to stay in that lane and then give her the flexibility to be there for our kids. I mean, our kids both do cheerleading and dance and soccer and volleyball. So it's like they have activities going on all the time. So it's like we're usually divided and conquering, you know, in the afternoons. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. So yeah, for sure. Back to this thing of the market is so horrible right now. I love this. If anybody watches the news every day, they're no longer in the business, but what I'm observing, and I've been saying this since I started CSU, that I feel like the, the team is the future brokerage. The agents today if I were to look at agents today that are solo agents, sure, you have those Mike Ferry agents that, you know, can go create appointments and get listings and get listings and get listings. Those guys are going to be okay. But the new agent coming into the business today, if they're not on a team, they will not exist. And even those agents who have been in the business for a few years, like I'm seeing them dissolve right now, which in my opinion, that's going to have a massive impact on the traditional brokerage. Because where do those agents like that all sit? They sit in a traditional brokerage where they're not getting the training. They're not getting the systems. They're not getting the leads. They're not getting all these things that you and other team owners are providing. So anyway, I think there's a massive shift happening right now. But what I want to really dig into is like, how is this impacting your team? So Brian, I I love times of uncertainty. The reason I love times of uncertainty is we prepared ourselves for this, right? I believe that there was a lot of people who got their real estate license in the last couple of years because it was easy. You were an order taker. And if you got your offer accepted or you were a listing agent, you were doing pretty good. Life was easy. You know, we do the basics. So we do scripting and role playing practice every Tuesday and Thursday. We have a Monday morning meeting every Monday. I have speakers who come in during the week to do additional training. We are all about the fundamentals and the foundation of skills because I believe that no matter what market you're in, skills will always win, okay? I love that you say that and share that, and yeah. thank you. In this market we're in today, my opinion is, if you don't have those skills, you won't exist. Totally agree. So I'm looking for a purge, right? The industry needs it. We need it. And this is an opportunity for us as a team to grow. Like full transparency, I had a conversation with someone yesterday about acquiring an entire team. Like those are the kind of conversations I'm having right now with with folks. And, you know, we're still focused on agent first, meaning we're going to continue to increase the amount of value they receive because we don't want them to leave. Right. And, And what I'm doing, and I say this and I'll say this to anybody, you know, like I am inevitably going to box out all of our competition in the greater Baton Rouge real estate market. Yeah. What I mean by that is I'm going to buy all the leads. I'm going to recruit all the agents. And I'm going to create a machine 
that it's just hard to compete with. Now, look, am I going to go get 13,000 transactions? Maybe not. But will I go from five to seven to 1,500 to, you know, and 3,000 over the next five to seven years? Absolutely. Yeah. So you said something there that I think is key. You said you're blocking everybody out by getting all the leads. But one of the things you said was recruiting all the agents. So let's talk about that for a minute. How many agents did you have a year ago, two years ago? And you're at 27 today. Is that right? Yeah, and like 12 or 13 last year, 15, I think at the peak. And then oh. but before that, it was like seven or eight. So where do you want to be a year from now, agent-wise? You know, so when it comes to agent-wise, it's the agent number is not as important as the person, as the agent, right? Like, do they fit culture, number one, first and foremost? Do they have a great work ethic? Are they willing to get better? So yeah, of course, I mean, like right now at 27, you know, 35 is a number that I think is like the next threshold for us. And then once we hit 35, I think that number becomes 50. And then once we hit 50, I think that number becomes 70. And, and I watch people around me. I watch like Parker Pemberton. I watch DJ and Lindsay. I watch Lisa Chinati. I mean, I watch, you know, these friends of mine in my circle that are growing, you know, I was on the phone with Jay Pitts yesterday. Jay Pitts, I think has 44 agents. And you know, Matt Curtis in, in Huntsville, I think he's probably pushing 40 something agents. To me, it's not necessarily about the agent count. It's about remaining profitable, right? And then continuing to grow and then having our agent like production. So like say we run about an 18 to 20 unit per average per agent, right? Like that's where we, like, I don't want to get to where we've just, now it's all about all these people everywhere and our agent productivity falls drastically because we can't continue to pour the way we want to. So Yes. Do we want more agents? Absolutely. Is there a number? Is there like a date by that? No. Right now it's like, how do we level the agents up that are in our organization now? And how do we make sure that they're all running at peak performance? And then, you know, we'll continue to organically just add from there. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Okay. For onboarding, are you doing, do you have systems in place for doing your agent onboarding as well? Yeah. So Trello is what we use now. And then of course we have everything just built into Trello to where it like, it, you know, it sends them to, Boomtown to do all their Boomtown training, you know, to send them to CSU videos to do all their CSU trainings. And then we have mentor agents. So it's typically about a two week process to get through it. It's pretty thorough, but we use, like I said, we use Trello and it's day by day by day, you know, <laughs> almost hour by hour. So it's, it's pretty dialed in. Instructing the agents on what they need to do. A hundred percent. And then they need to sit with their mentor. They need to do some shadowing. They need to go on some buyer appointments and you go on some listing appointments. I mean, they, you know, there's the, you know, on the computer stuff. And then there's the OJT, right? There's the on the job training. And it's, that's the most important. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're about out of time here, but any last words of advice you'd like to share? I would say most of our listeners are probably team leaders, maybe broker owners and yeah. some agents. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things is just, I'll say this, it's not about Trey, right? It's not about Brian. You know, it's about the agents. You know, for me, it's how do I impact and influence as many people as I can. Like when they leave this organization, like I want to say, man, like, man, Trey poured into me and he really helped me with my mindset. And, you know, he just helped me become more disciplined and and more and like accept accountability and things like that. So like, I really focus on like the agent and like, what's important to the agent? Why are you here? Number one, why did you choose to come work with the W group? Most importantly, what do you feel like I can help you accomplish over the next? Like if, if we were to look back in the next, let's call it 12 months, what would be a big win for you? Right. And what do you want to do from a business standpoint? What do you do want to do from a financial standpoint? What do you want to do from a personal standpoint? Like, I really like, you know, I eat the same shit every day out of a Tupperware container. You know what I mean? If anybody knows me, like, I'm just like, I have to operate on like, like being very disciplined and everything just has to be prepared. And it's got to be, that's me. And like, I, I just, I try to be a good example and I try to lead the way that I would expect a leader to lead. And that's what I do. And I really care about my people and I pour into them as much as I can. So I'm just like, if you're a team leader, like, I mean, it's not about you. It's not about the team. It's about the agents and, and helping them get what they want. And the old Zig Ziglar saying, right, you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. So that's like a kind of my mindset, my motto. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Trey, it's been fun to watch you grow and to watch you expand in your career and to evolve and see your family grow. And anyway, congratulations on all of your success. Thank you. And I'm excited to see that keep growing. And I'm confident in a few years, you're going to be talking about thousands of transactions. So that's the goal of my friend. Yeah. Work and thank you for joining us on the show today.
Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Super grateful for it, man. And keep doing what you're doing, man. You're changing. Like I said, you're changing the real estate industry, whether you realize it or not. So keep it up. Well, thank you for that. If you were going to be at our conference next week, you would be there live for this, but we are announcing some things that we really do feel will change the real estate industry forever. So I can't wait to hear it, man. Tell my boy, Mac Hill, to give me a call whenever y'all wrap. All right. Will do. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brian. See you, buddy. See you, Trey. Thank you for joining us on our podcast. If you have an interest in a free seven-day trial of Sisu, go to sisu.co, S-I-S-U dot C-O. Make sure that you use the coupon code GRIT, that's G-R-I-T, to waive all your set of fees and receive a 10% discount on your subscription. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and want to subscribe, search GRIT, the real estate growth mindset on iTunes, Spotify, or Podbean. And with that, we'll catch you next time. Take care.